bam, bam, yeah. Hey everybody, welcome again to another episode of the ADHD Shop. I'm Ash, the engineer with more projects than common sense. And if you're like me and are stuck behind a desk all day, you find yourself always dreaming and hardly driving. So here I am today, and finally at the shop amidst all this fire and smoke to hopefully explain the projects that I have going on in the shop. The first tier of projects are ones that I like to call the Ah, crap. The Ah, crap. Projects usually involve some form of part replacement or upkeep, an example of which was the 1970 Opel Cadet wagon and driveline repair in the second episode, as well as the Brake Master Cylinder on the 1972 Toyota FJ40 from the first episode. Now, these are the result of either wearing out from time or my daily driving abuse. They occur at the most random instant, either, either in driveways, random parking lots, or on the side of the road. This level of project usually involves a little bit of common sense, a lot of money for the parts, and more importantly, time. Like this 2004 BMW 330i ZHB, with about 120,000 miles on the clock, it's at the same point at every BMW where it needs suspension bushings, brake rotors and pads, ball joints and tie rods, cooling system water pump and thermostat, as well as an overhaul of the BMW variable valve timing system called Venus. And while these projects are intended to be completed in about a weekend, mine usually take anywhere between 1 to 27 years. Why? Because weekends spent behind a desk at work instead of a shop or garage. Monetary constraints. Or more importantly, weekends being spent behind the desk instead of the shop or garage. The middle tier projects are ones that I'd like to call the... Ah, sh**. The... Ah, sh**. It usually involves some form of catastrophic failure that snowballs into a huge mechanical restoration. And that restoration also includes the project previously in the... Ah, crap. Projects which include the while I'm in there's, and that can include normal part replacements or overall updates to things to get things up to speed. Because, you know, while I'm in there... Projects in this tier include the sweet rear-engine French four-door Simca Rally Replica. Now, you don't see too many of these things in the U.S., but these were popular in Europe amongst the rally and hill climb circuits. This car was imported from a group of friends of mine from the BMW 2002 community and was part of a trade between a 1965 bus and an M10 motor built for the BMW 2002s. But in typical Ash fashion, I blew the motor within three days, which caused me to re-engineer the entire driveline. So instead of rebuilding what came to be a 1980s Dodge Omni motor, instead using this Honda ZC or D16 motor that was commonly found in the 1991 CRX SIs. Along with that, the engine will be an overhaul of the cooling system, which included a ton of brass piping and cracked rubber hosing that caused the leak, which ended up causing my head to warp in the engine. So that will be replaced with a Davies Craig adjustable flow water pump, a three-core aluminum radiator, as well as new plumbing to go from the rear where the engine is to the front where the radiator is. To couple that Honda engine to the existing transmission, I'm going to have to redesign the input shaft of the engine, which is actually the output shaft of the transmission, to match the spline count for the new clutch. Once that's all done and put together, we'll hopefully have a running car again. The third type of projects are ones that I'd like to call the... Ah, are you kidding me? Ah. These projects include everything found in the... Ah, crap project as well as the ah sh and that includes part replacements and overhauls to re-engineering. This project is a 1960 Mark I Mini that is slated to become an electric using that Fiat 500E that we talked about earlier in the previous episode. Now before we actually begin that process, this project consists of everything including those first two tiers along with additional rotisserie work to take care of some of his body work including bad rust uh, repair as well as sheet metal replacements to get this thing into a top notch shape before we do the conversion. Now this also includes a rotisserie build as well so we'll go over that but before we do any of that, I wanted to kind of touch upon some of the basic hardware of an electric vehicle, using that Fiat 500D as an example. But there's nothing for it, just exclamations and shots boring. We need monster truck announcers, big head metal mask, twirling drumsticks like you, short puffies, tacos, and if we're safe, we're all pushed up protected gear. No, no, no explosions. Here 
Here's our 2014 Fiat 500E from last time. Now, on that episode, I touched upon a little bit of battery theory in the form of a kid's book. This time, I'll just cut to the crap and just poke at things and start explaining. Cut to the crap. Pretty common looking, right? Well, there are some subtle differences when you compare this Fiat 500E to a regular gas version along the edge tube. That includes blocking off air inlets to reduce that aerodynamic drag, as well as the obvious fact that, that there are no exhaust pipes. Otherwise, this Fiat is just like any other car on the road. I can't tell. Let's look inside of the guts of this Fiat 500E. Easy guts. Let's start off with the heart of any electric vehicle, the battery. The battery in this Fiat 500E is a lithium manganese cobalt chemistry rated at 24 kilowatt hours of capacity. This chemistry is known for high power density watts per kilogram. and in this configuration is roughly 360 volts with a rating of 63 amp hours. So why do EVs run at such high voltage? Well, the higher the voltage, the less current you'll need to produce the same power. Less current means thinner cables, less electromagnetic noise coming from high current cables, as well as lower heat and electrical losses which are a function of your current. Since the batteries are the heart of the EV, control of those batteries is just as important. Because power is nothing without control. Electric vehicles manufactured by major companies all have a battery management system, or BMS. <laughs> The BMS takes discharge and charge performance data of each cell to help predict its performance while in the vehicle. This is called an active BMS, where the system can adjust the level of performance to increase the health and longevity based on the environmental factors like temperature. The BMS also communicates to the cooling system of the batteries to keep the batteries thermally stable, while ensuring excessive current isn't drawn while the batteries are either hot or low in energy. <laughs> By actively managing the batteries, the BMS can also predict any system faults and prevent any catastrophic issues by enabling contactors or methods to decouple the battery, like a fuel pump cutoff switch would do on a regular car. Most aftermarket or conversions may use less volatile chemistries like lithium iron phosphate, which can be used with less expensive and less intense battery monitoring systems. Passive BMS displays battery voltage, current, and temperature as it's being discharged or charged. As you first sit inside and start a regular car, you hear a starter motor that starts the engine. In an electric car, as you key on, the lead-acid battery supplies power to actuate contactors, which act like switches on your battery pack. Some contactors and power electronics are designed with some form of soft start functionality, where power is gradually able to pass through the rest of the system to avoid any damage from current inrush or spikes that could damage sensitive electronics. Think of a dam holding water. This is like your battery, and the water is your current. Let's say you want to release some of this water. The contactor acts like a dam in a soft start situation. When a contactor opens, it allows some water or current to flow through it, slowly at first. Then it allows for full flow, and everybody wins. A simple contactor without any soft start will allow full flow, allowing all water to rush through, whereas things get messy. Once you engage the contactors, though, and power the vehicle on, the main battery is engaged. The first thing you'll see on any EV is an SOC, or battery state of charge gauge. Your traditional gas tank has a volume of gas that's displayed. Your EV, however, shows a percentage of capacity. One thing to know that, almost like gasoline, the harder you drive, the more you use. With your batteries, the more current you draw, the less current capacity you'll have before your cell protection from your active BMS kicks in to make sure your temperatures and everything are managed. While protecting itself, it may provide a conservative value for capacity. Ultimately, the SOC is a function of your voltage, current capacity, temperature, and is not a simple gauge. This will vary as you drive. Let's look inside one of the Fiat 500E battery packs. Check out my other videos for EV maintenance and purchasing a used EV. But if you get to this point where you have to drop the battery or open up the casing, don't! Unless you have all the correct high voltage and safety gloves or insulated tools, do not attempt to open up these packs. <laughs> On top of these batteries are large service disconnects, which prevent any large voltages to appear on the outside terminals. Inside, however, each module will have a voltage along the terminal, so it's important to have all your safety precautions in place. 
Inside of the battery, you'll see a hodgepodge of modules, wires, and plumbing. This Fiat 500E has 17 24-volt modules. Each module consists of six 4-volt prismatic cells along with individual voltage, current, and temperature sense on each cell with information sent through the wiring harness to the BMS. The BMS is broken up into master and slave modules. Not the most politically correct terminology, but it wasn't intended to be While other EVs may have different styles of cells, like the Tesla and the 18650 cell, many of them have some form of pressure relief or ventilation in any case of thermal runaway. These blue hoses are ventilation ports that allow any potential gases to escape the module, should any issues arise like thermal runaway. Underneath the battery is a metal plate that contacts a cooling plate to allow the battery to cool through conduction. Those contacts, as we talked about earlier, are tucked underneath this area. These flat bars are heat shrink covered multi-layer copper bus bars, or branded as flex cable. These consist of multiple layers of thin copper that are pressed together and formed to connect each terminal. These don't require additional cutting or crimping and again should be handled with caution when attached to live batteries. Simply put, the battery stores energy and provides voltage and current. Now the fun part, where does that voltage and current go? It is fed to the power electronics of the vehicle, like gas that goes into your engine. That high voltage from the battery goes through a DC to DC converter, which, as the name implies, converts the high voltage DC power from your battery, which is usually 300 to 400 volts, to a manageable 12 to 14 volts, used to keep your chassis lead acid battery healthy, like your alternator does with your gas or diesel engine. That lead acid battery is then used to power all of your headlights, radios, and more importantly, your chassis and vehicle controller. The vehicle controller is connected to all of the power electronics and accepts driver inputs, which include things like how much you press your accelerator pedal, your gear selection, as well as your accessories like air conditioning. The vehicle controller communicates through all of the systems through a controller area network, or CAN, where messages are sent and fed back and forth to the hardware and to the controller. What do they say to each other? Mom, Dad, Peggy, look at her butt. Connector, butt connector, I mean, I mean, look at her butt connector. Walking around top us like she owns the place. They generally send health or performance messages or error messages. The CAN network, like in your modern regular car, also manages creature comforts like power steering and air conditioning. Traditionally, those are runoff rotations every gasoline or diesel engine through a belt. Since there is no engine, those accessories are now electrically driven, using the same power from your electric car battery. Even your brake booster, which uses vacuum from your engine traditionally, is now replaced with an electric brake booster. Speaking of rotations, let's talk about the motor. We'll start off with a few different motor styles commonly found in electric cars. The voltage and current generated from your main traction battery is fed into an inverter where it is then converted into three-phase AC power. You have two styles of motor, permanent magnet or PM synchronous or AC induction, both of which have a rotor and stator. In the PM synchronous case, the rotor is fed a DC voltage to excite and start the motor, while the stator is fed the AC power. In the synchronous motor, electrical frequency is synchronized with the motor's rotating speed, where field current is provided externally, like through an inverter and sent through the stator. An induction or asynchronous motor is slightly different, where the field current is supplied by induction from the stator to the rotor. That field creates a current that is induced into the rotor, which creates a slight loss in actual speed compared to the desired speed. Okay, the last big thing is the charger. Now, some may think that the electric vehicle supply equipment, or EVSC, is the charger. Well, it's not. The EVSC is like a smart contactor acting as a gatekeeper between the power from the wall to the actual charger that's in your vehicle. The EVSC performs a series of checks by communicating to the vehicle through an SAE protocol and conductive automotive charge requirement called J1772 through a pilot and proximity signal. All manufacturers have to comply with the specification. J1772 confirms that the vehicle is properly grounded and that the battery system is capable of accepting charge. There 
are three levels of conductor charging, level 1, level 2, and DC fast charging. We'll just focus on level 1 and level 2. Level 1 allows the use of a regular wall outlet's 120 volt 15 amp service. You're only allowed to pull 80% of that maximum amperage, so in reality, you can only pull about 12 amps, which equates to about 1440 watts maximum charge. For level 2, you have 208 or 240 volt single phase AC voltage, with a maximum of 80 amps for up to 19,000 watts. Sorry, the last thing is the cooling system. All of your sensitive power electronics require some form of cooling, either air-cooled or water-cooled. If you have water-cooled components, you will most likely have a radiator like a regular car and some form of water pump to circulate that fluid. That fluid is most likely a mixture of ethylene glycol or regular coolant and water. Always treat the coolant as you would your regular car with intermittent inspections of fluid levels and fluid quality. Your battery system may have its own cooling system that's completely isolated from the rest of the system, and that will prevent any contamination of the coolant. As always, check your owner's manual to see what your service intervals and inspection points are, as well as the correct fluids used when it comes time to replace anything. Now we're finished. Remember to send me a note.